They came together. It sucks. My, my complaint is that there isn't one joke in this whole movie. <laughs> the film wasn't too great. Almost never yeah, funny. Hopefully, I will see a good comedy at some point in the future to make up for the garbage that was this movie. But after watching it, I didn't really feel as if I'd watched the film. It almost feels like the director just wants to make the audience very angry. I said 2.8. A 2.8. I said yeah. a 2. I'm not recommending it. Thumbs down. This movie is the funniest movie I've ever seen. Usually when I say something like that, it can be interpreted as hyperbole or irony, but I think this is actually true. I don't think there's any other movie I can watch that has made me laugh this consistently every time I watch it. The first time I watched it, I had to pause because I was laughing so much. Yeah, tell me about it. And that usually never happens with comedies. It's one of those few movies I've seen that just feels like it perfectly caters to my weird and specific comedy tastes. Oh, it was just one of those things, you know, we wanted different things. I wanted a family, settle down, start a life together. And what did she want? Who can say? I guess you'd have to ask my brother. Oh. Is he here? Can I ask him? Yes. Keith, you have a second? What's up? Hey, Keith, I was just wondering, what did Hillary want that was different than what Egbert wanted? Uh, she just wanted to travel more. She wanted to focus on her photojournalism career, and marriage just wasn't conducive to that. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Keith. For those of you who don't know what the fuck this movie is, they came together as a 2014 romantic comedy starring Paul Rudd, Amy Poehler, and a whole bunch of funny dudes. It's directed by David Wayne and written by David Wayne and Michael Showalter. You may recognize these guys' works with Wet Hot American Summer, both the movie and the Netflix series, as well as Wayne's other comedies with Paul Rudd, Wanderlust, and Role Models. You gonna take that dip? You gonna take that dick, huh? David Wayne said that this is the film they intended to make as their follow-up to Wet Hot American Summer back in the early 2000s, but no studios wanted to take it. And thus, the script sat in the drawer for about a decade until a sketch comedy festival back in 2012, where they did a table read of the script with Paul and Amy there, and it went over really well. From there, they got the green light from Lionsgate to make the film not long after that. On a small budget, they shot the film in under a month, and then it came out a couple years later in limited release and on demand. As for the plot, if you've seen any other romantic comedy, it's, it's that. With the most notable comparison I can think of being You've Got Mail starring Tom Hanks. Boy works at big corporation, girl works at independent store. They hate each other, they love each other. They hate each other, then love each other again by the end. But the whole point of this movie is that it takes that template of the run of the mill rom-com and uses that as a framework to structure jokes around. It 100% takes that Zucker Brother era of comedies like Top Secret or Airplane or The Naked Gun, which do a similar thing of taking a genre and using the typical story beats as a jumping off point. Hey. I guess you could almost call this a parody movie with how meta and self-aware it is about the tropes, but not a parody in the same way as like Scary Movie or Superhero Movie, Epic Movie, Poop Movie, or any of these stupid movies where you have to have seen the movies they're parodying to get the jokes. Everyone involved in this knew exactly what they were making, and it really just feels like a bunch of friends hanging out and having fun making a movie. I mean, just take a listen to what all the cast think of it. It's like absurd and silly and very stupid. I like how stupid and dumb it is. It's ridiculous and it's silly and it's wonderful. I talked a little bit in my previous video about watching movies with the filmmaker's intent in mind, rather than projecting your own expectations. And I think this is a film that achieves exactly what it's set out to do. I appreciate any movie, especially comedies that just fully commits to what they are making, and isn't afraid to go into dumb territory just because it can. The majority of the runtime just commits to having as many gags as possible, and they'll take things as far as they can. Nothing is off limits. It just feels like a matter of going, is it funny? Yes. Does it make sense? It's like I have a pole up his ass or what? Mm. Watch out, Joel! He does! Not really. But that's not as important in the moment as getting a laugh, which can be risky for people that don't get the comedy. But for those that do, it's like the best thing ever. Let me let me talk about the various types of gags we get in this movie. So often they'll have a joke that's just so mundane and obvious that's funny. Either because they run with it and keep building on top of it, 
or just not address it at all. The jokes sometimes are just not, they're intentionally, not even intentionally bad, they're intentionally banal, like they're nothing. He's not afraid to shy away from that, knowing that that kind of thing might not appeal to everybody, but it completely slays me. I'm gonna pursue my dream and open my own coffee shop, Cup of Joel. You've probably all heard of Cup of Joe. This is a play on that, because of my name being Joel. I'm gonna, yeah, so you get it, Cup of Joel, Cup of Joe, Cup of Joel. And if you're a fan of visual gags, this movie's got visual gags uh, all over. Go jump in a lake, meathead. <laughs> There's a few times where they'll have a visual gag play as a payoff to some other extended dialogue bit, like this muffin order. Uh, she will have a low-fat, sugar-free banana yogurt muffin. If you don't have that, then half of a poppy seed muffin with the poppy seeds taken out and heat it up. If you can't heat it up, then take half the poppy seeds out and... <laughs> Coffee to number three? Well, they will have a visual gag that's already surreal in a sense, and just make it even more absurd. My, I had no idea. The only line you care about is the bottom line. Look. Well, then there's parts like this where in the middle of a montage, it will just turn into a music video. David Zucker of the Zucker Brothers actually has a list of rules that he abides to in writing comedy. And I think a lot of those rules are things that David Wayne has adopted, whether that be subconscious or intentional. Especially the rules of acknowledgement and joke on joke. Acknowledgement being when a character in the foreground is ignoring or not noticing a gag happening in the background. And joke on joke being that if there is a joke in the background, there can't be one in the foreground, or vice versa. It also breaks some of the rules though, especially the ones pertaining to characters acknowledging that they are in a film which they do many times. The story really is like a corny movie. I know, the only difference is it's not a movie. It's our real life. I'll admit that these are the jokes that fall most flat for me, but it's not without moments where it's done right. For example, there is this obvious foreshadowing that is so obvious that they can use that to milk some comedy. And I'm not talking about obvious foreshadowing like in 21 Jump Street. I'm talking like this. If I was ever about to marry someone and then realize that I didn't want to do it, you know where I would go? Uh random guess, but Boston? No, the Brooklyn Promenade. Which makes it funny at the end when Paul Rudd still goes to the wrong location. We don't have any way to know where she might be. I think I know. She's not here! Are you sure that's what she said? I know where she is! Follow me! Funny, funny. I just love when throwaway lines get built upon and end up having a payoff in any movie, but in comedy it can be utilized in really fun ways. Especially during the climax where a bunch of little pieces come into play. Oh shit, Michael Shannon with a sword, oh fuck. With it being a rom-com, they really do play into that melodrama a lot. And you can see the actors just having so much fun with it. Hey Jake. Yeah. Thanks. Joel, one last thing. What's up? Thanks. Jake! Yo. Thanks. To me, it really shows just how much more entertaining a comedy can be when every single actor is so in tune with what they're creating. But you know what? Why should I just sit here explaining why things are funny? Everybody has a different idea of what a funny even is. Also, most people don't even know what this movie is, and half the people that do think it sucks. It sucks. But is that going to stop me from loving it? No, and it shouldn't. Sure, there are imperfections and moments I don't care for, but on the whole, the joyous experience I get from watching it, no other comedy would dare. <laughs> Which is why I want to say to you, the listener, there in your toilet or messy bed or stinky couch or public library, don't worry about liking the same films as everyone else. Like the films that elicit an emotional response from you, whether that be joy, sadness, or deep discomfort, because at the end, those are the films you will remember and hold near and dear to you for years to come. Sure, I've seen Casablanca. It was good, probably. Do I remember it? No. And you know why? It's because I didn't feel nothing watching it. Sure, maybe if I watched it now, not when I was 16, maybe I can watch it in a different light. But shut up, that's the best example I could think of. Because I, I like Citizen Kane. It's revolutionary. So you're probably thinking, is this guy really saying this movie where a guy shits in his pants is better than Casablanca? You shit your pants. And, and yes, maybe I am, because I'm an individual and thus certain films will impact me more than others. Despite their classic cinema status, 
And isn't that the beauty of life? That there are over 7 billion people on this earth and we're all separate entities that have all lived separate lives. And thus we'll react to certain things in different ways, bringing our own experiences and perspectives to the art we consume. And I think that's beautiful. I don't understand why so many people on Twitter or Facebook or wherever insult each other for having different opinions on a movie. Of course people have different opinions. That person is not you. And what is the goal of arguing with that person about this movie? To change their mind? To make them feel inferior about their tastes and art? Shut up! You enjoy your movie where a lady sits in her house and cooks for three hours and he enjoy their Ant-Man and the Wasp. Doesn't matter to anything. We all live inside our own little bubble sometimes and it's easy to forget that these movies are in fact just movies. And if people are obnoxious enough to want to tear you down for liking a movie they think is dog shit, then that's on them. See, I went to film school and some of the people you meet there are some of the most obnoxious people you'll ever meet because they think loving Blade Runner 2049 and hating The Last Jedi makes them superior to you. Even though because you are a different person with a whole life's worth of different thoughts, maybe you found a lot to resonate in The Last Jedi, like how failure is inevitable and rushing into something bigger than yourself, and how you can use that failure as a strength to better yourself going forward, and that you don't need to be defined by who you were in the past. But no, Luke drinks green milk, and I thought that was dumb. So everything you resonated with as a visceral and personal reaction, it doesn't matter. Fuck that guy. Love your Gemini mans and your Star Wars and your Twilight and your They Came Togethers. Because life is short. You could die tomorrow. You ever think about that? You could just be walking down the sidewalk and some car could just flip into your face and you would not exist. Or maybe you don't go outside tomorrow. But what's stopping a helicopter from just spiraling down into your bedroom and taking down everything you've worked for? Sure, safety regulations and good pilots, that's what. But you, maybe they could have an unlucky day or engine failure or something else that helicopters need to work. So enjoy the little things. Pursue the big things. Hold your loved ones. Tell your friends how much you appreciate them always being there, even though they could literally cut you out at any moment, and there's nothing you could do about it. Wouldn't that suck? But you know what? Love prevails in all scenarios. Unless you're in a scenario between you and a man with a gun, which in that case, the gun probably wins. But who knows? You may be lucky or charming enough to get out of that. And that's why I give They Came Together a 10 out of 10.